on today's Story Beat. Um, so I would say if you're coming out of with a theater degree and you want to do theme parks, go take classes with the IES. Join the Themed Entertainment Association, Next Gen. They have a whole group of up and coming. Uh, and get involved in the Themed Entertainment Association. And you kind of got to be there. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, lighting designer Paula Dinkle, fell in love with stage lighting in junior high school. Her dance and music training were a perfect lead-in to a life in entertainment lighting design. Growing up in a military family prepared her for frequent travel and overseas relocations. She earned her BA, MA, and MFA from Cal State University Fullerton in both lighting and scene design. While a student, she worked as an assistant technical director and became a founding member of the Cabaret Dinner Theater in Fullerton, California. Paula taught part-time at Golden West College, Cal State San Bernardino, and full-time for a year at USC in Los Angeles, which is where we first met. She was my boss in the School of Drama during that year. In 1980, Paula was recruited by WED Enterprises, now Walt Disney Imagineering, or WDI, and began her 38-plus year career in theme park lighting design. Her most notable design projects include numerous shops, restaurants, and landscapes at Disneyland. She was the lead lighting designer for Disney Quest at Walt Disney World and Chicago, and for Club Disney and Disney Studios Paris. Her favorite project is the rock and roller coaster Avec Aerosmith at Disney Studios Paris. Her continuing role as an educator includes working with stage lighting and controls manufacturer ETC on their student sponsorship and mentoring program. Now retired from Disney, she consults on theme park projects, including on site lighting direction for the Motion Gate theme park in Dubai. Paula is also one of the contributing authors of the book, Women of Walt Disney Imagineering, 12 Women Reflect on Their Trailblazing Theme Park Careers. So for all those reasons and many more, it's a truly great joy for me to welcome my friend, the extraordinarily talented lighting designer, Paula Dinkel, to Story Beat today. Paula, how wonderful it is for you to be my, the guest on my show today. I'm delighted to be here. It's good to see you again. It is good to see you. Absolutely. So let's go back a little bit, even back before um, you were at Cal State Fullerton, before all this. What was the first time, it wasn't just in high school, was it, when you saw light for the first time and thought, huh, that's unique and different and I'm interested in it? Was it in high school? Uh, no, not really. It was in uh, junior college. I didn't really have a direction after high school of what I wanted to do. And I went to junior college at Allen Hancock College in Santa Maria, California. <laughs> and they had a theater program um, that was a conservatory program uh, called the Pacific Conservatory of the Performing Arts. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe I'd be a journalism major. Um, I didn't think I was talented enough to pursue music. I certainly gave up dance. And um, but I, so I was taking classes and I was playing in the orchestra for fun. And I saw a flyer on the bulletin board asking for dancers to audition for a show called Half a Sixpence, a musical. Right. And I, I thought, oh, that'll be fun. So I got cast. I had one line and I danced in the show. But when you work on stage in, in educational theater, you also have to work backstage. Right. So they got us all together and they said, okay, all the boys go to the scene shop. All the girls go to the costume shop, which I thought was really sexist. And I hate sewing. So I said, can I go to the scene shop? And they went, yeah, sure. So I started messing around with lights and learned to use the, the power equipment and build things. And then I got to run a show. To run a show. I had a 10 scene preset board I was running and a show called um, the subject was roses. Yes, that's a play. 
right? It's a play, yes. And there was this wonderful moment where I had to execute light cue and I could feel the tension of the audience. It was this most magical thing. I could feel them. I could feel the actor and I knew that I had to get this light cue just right when he went to turn on a lamp and the cover light comes up and I did it just right. And I could feel the audience, they, could, they visibly relaxed because they knew that the actor, well, the character was okay. And it was like electric for me. It was, it was wonderful to have that kind of um, effect on an audience and, and to have something to say with light so you you made you made an immediate and direct connection between light and performance yes it wasn't yeah. just light in you know natural light in the world or turning on a lamp in your house this was a direct connection to an emotional moment yes and it helped tell the story and move the story forward and that was exciting do you think of yourself as a storyteller with light absolutely everything starts with the story for me yeah I think that's true for where, where it is the what we do in the theater and in film and in TV. It is all about the story and we all pull toward the the telling of whatever that tale is. Um, yeah. So so you eventually go off and you decide you're going to be go into both scene design and lighting design to Cal State Fullerton, right? Yeah. Uh, after I got through working a, se- a full summer rep season at Alan Hancock and the which was five shows in rep. Right. Um, and the next summer I went up to Sacramento Music Circus and I ran props with, again, I discovered some more magic with light in a show of Man of La Mancha. It was like thrilling. And when I, I transferred to Cal State Fullerton, that was my thing. I, I worked lights. I uh, was a, an assistant Oh, in a paid position of the lighting assistant in the light lab. So I could work my way through school. You became a true techie, as we say. I did. I did. I, I threw on my my black jeans and my black shirt and put my crescent wrench in my pocket. And I was I was hanging lights. You were in, you were in, lights. You were in heaven. <laughs> Literally, I was. <laughs> literally and figuratively. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so did you at that point have a sense that you would be in the field of lighting for the rest of your career? Yeah, I I hope so. I, I thought I would be in the theater for my whole career. Um, and it didn't turn out that way. But um, well, kind uh, of kind of a theater. Yeah, yeah. It's a different kind of storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we'll talk about Disney here in just a moment. But yeah, it's a yeah. different kind of storytelling. But still, you're still telling a story. And yes, and you're still evoking emotion with light. And getting yeah. a, a visceral response from an audience, you know, um, yeah. who are who would you say were your lighting design heroes as you were coming up in the business? Well, Jean Rosenthal to start with. Mm-hmm. Her book was published the same year I was at at, um, sat at uh, Allen Hancock College, and she uh, it was a fascinating book. The Magic of Light is the name of the book, and it was inspirational. The other one was. My lighting teacher, my first one, which is Barbara Sellers, and uh, and then the the artistic director Donovan Marley encouraged me all to go that direction, and it was exciting. Did it you was, did you actually design shows at PCPA? No, nope, no, nope. I was a hired hand. I was a stage manager for for Donovan Marley, which was, you know, I liked that part of it. And I liked running the light boards. And I, I just wanted to be a part of that kind of storytelling, that magic that theater is. I think it's interesting that you were a stage manager. Do you think that stage management had an impact on how you look at lighting over the long haul? Um, yes, it, it did. And and the, the my music and dance training affected my stage management. Because of the That's movement also. of the light and the way that cues work and so on, yeah? Yes. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, how stories progress where you, you, you build up and build up and then come down and then build up and come down as it works in music that way and dance. So for me, that was like easy to be a stage manager in that respect is that I got the rhythms of the show. I understood it. So, uh, you know, what would you say is, um, what is it about lighting that, that, actually transforms 
not just the space, but the way people think. Why, why light? What is it about light? I think it speaks to life in general. Um, life, you know, is nothing without light. You can't see anything without light. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it makes a difference to us emotionally and to how our eyes see the world. What color is the light and where is it coming from and how bright it is and how does it change from shadow to bright? You know, it, it's, it's important even to know where to put the shadows. So sometimes I think of myself as a dark designer. So you know where to put the darkness so the light comes out. Mm, that's interesting. You think of yourself as a dark designer because you're adding light only where you need it. Yes. And everything yeah. else is then dark. Or, or dark, shadowy. Or darker. Or oh, darker. <laughs> yeah. Darker than where it's light. Um, yeah. So, so all right. Um, obviously, lighting design involves both artistry and a degree of technical um, information. You have to know how electricity works, and you have to understand the way that the boards, lighting boards operate, and so on. And here's, here's a certain kind of a light fixture. And... Would you consider yourself to be an artist or a craftsperson or a technician or all of the above? I think it's all of the above because you kind of have to start with the technical aspects first. You have to know, um, know your fixtures, know what they can do, know how to hang them, how to circuit them, how to control, um, how to choose the color. To, it, it, it all has to work together. And once you understand the mechanics of it, then it helps you become a better designer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm a really a, a hands-on person. I, I love focusing lights. There's a real artistry to it. And, you know, it just helps me be a better designer to, under, to know all of that. It, it's critical that you put lights in the right place, not only to do what you said before, which is, is to put the light where you want it and not in the dark where you want it to be dark. But, but that is critical to the way that people then perceive that light and how it, it translates into some form of an emotional moment. Yes. Yeah. Um, sitting in the, in, the, in the theater, moving around, you know, you have to go uh, see it from the audience point of view and how are they going to take it mm -hmm. and how the actors are going to feel about it. It's not just about the audience. It's about helping the actors be the character they're supposed to be and to help help them find their light which is something i had to do in teaching was to teach students they didn't know why they had to take a lighting class right there were actors right and so the first thing i taught them was how to find their light so it'd be one light and an actor on stage and help them move around until they got in the spot where they could and learn how to feel where the light was. Yes, but it's a lot cooler and it doesn't blind you if you stand out of the light. Yes, really. <laughs> <laughs> and then then the lighting designer sits in the audience and goes, get in the light, get in the light. I know. I know, with all the other students sitting in the house, watching the actor on stage find their light, mm -hmm. they got to see where it was. If you step out of it, you know, the audience can't see you. Why, so, why it doesn't work for them you, as an actor. Yeah, exactly. Right. So they got it. <laughs> they got it. <laughs> um, so uh, do you think of yourself as a painter with light? Yes. Yes, definitely. Color is so important in what's going on to, to, to again, in, in service to the story mm -hmm. of making the costumes look like they're supposed to look. And, and there's always a close collaboration between the set designer the costume designer, the director, the lighting designer, to um, to meet the director's expectations and the actor's needs on stage. It's very, very important. A lighting designer can ruin a color scheme for a show. Oh, no question. Or they can enhance it and, sure. and help the story go along. Yeah, put, put up some nice green lighting on red costumes and see what happens. Uh, absolutely. You can have an actor on stage in this beautiful, bathed in beautiful light. And, and if you've lit an area nearby on purpose in a little bit of green, perhaps, so that if the actor is supposed to moving into a dark emotional moment, they can step into that color and their costume will, will damp, will dampen. Transform, transform. Transform. Yes, that's the right word. 
it, yeah. it'll turn into a different color because the, yes. the you're, you're getting a mixture of the light color on the on the pigment color in the costume and it'll change the way it looked exactly and a lighting designer has to have all you have you obviously have uh, you're a master of all that so uh, um so one of the things i'm curious about before we move on to disney because i want to dig in on disney a little bit when i first started designing lighting and when i first met you we were still drafting on paper i yeah. assume you don't draft on paper anymore no <laughs> It's all in some kind of a, a computerized CAD program of some sort. Yeah, that was the thing. Uh, uh, let's say we we did even that even at Disney we did um, drawings by hand at first because that was 1980 and we were still doing uh, developing our own our own blue lines and uh, at the time. But computers came in first; they were Macs and later PCs and um, we had to learn to draw on them. So I learned AutoCAD. Early on. And, yeah, pretty early on. So yeah. you've been using computers for a long time at this point. Yeah, yep. And and, and if somebody said to you, you need to go back to drafting, do you think you could? Oh, sure. I still have my templates. You still have, <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're handy to have sometimes, you know. I you know, just I can't, know. I, I'm very sentimental about them. I can't. I just can't let them go. Well, I should I'm, probably give them away to somebody, but no, hang on to them. They're their keepsake. Um, so all right, so let's talk about Disney because this is the bulk of your uh, lighting career, obviously. Yeah. Um, how did you get that gig in the first place? What happened? Oh, well, when we were working at USC, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you remember Daniel Flannery? Oh, right? sure, Dan Flannery. Okay. Uh, Dan Flannery, yes. And um, uh, I saw in in Theater Crafts Magazine in, in about November of 1979, thereabouts, there was an ad for building a better mouse. And you know, we worked a lot of hours at USC. Oh, yes. And I, was, I had a five-year-old son and I was commuting from Eagle Rock to downtown right. LA. It was, and working long hours and designing shows and teaching classes. And as you know, all of that, it was, it was a lot. Well, there was this ad in Theater Crafts Magazine for building a better mouse. And they were specifically looking for special effects designers and audio designers and lighting designers. And I went, ooh, hmm, what is this WED company? I never even heard of it before. Right. And I went to college at Cal State Fullerton, which is right next door to Anaheim. And I had never even heard of WED. And it never occurred to me that there were lighting designers. I mean, I've been to Disneyland a lot, but you know, there were lighting designers who actually lit the shops and the attractions. It never, it just sort of went over my head, you know? And- You, um, you probably thought it was some maintenance guy that just came in at night. I, yeah, something like that. <laughs> I, and I knew there were entertainment lighting designers because I knew fellow students who worked there who were doing entertainment shows and stuff. Mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. So. But I didn't. It, I just didn't give it a thought because I was so focused on theater. Anyway, I sent in my my letter uh, applying, and they said no thanks. And that was in November. And long about June, when I was supposed to sign my contract for the next year, I got a phone call uh, asking me to come in and interview. So it was like, whoa! So I interviewed, <clears throat> and it went well. And the next week, I interviewed with Roly Crump. Right. Um, who's one of the, uh, you know, legendary designers at, at Imagineering and who, who worked with Walt himself. Yes. And a week later I was an Imagineer. Wow. So, it, yeah. And I didn't sign my contract, obviously. And uh, obviously. That's, where, that's where Pam Rank moved, who was the assistant technical director for, and ran the shop at USC. And she took over lighting at SC when I left. And then a couple of years later, I think it was 89 or so, um, she was hired at Imagineering as well. Right. Yeah. So, so, well, I mean, it's obviously because if you're in Southern California, it makes it easier to hire someone that's there rather than to go out of town. Yeah. Um, and they're good. WED, which stands for Walter Elias Disney Imagineering, which is now yeah. Walt Disney Imagineering, WDI, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. They're pretty good at... Um, at hiring local, I mean, yep. they, they, they just are. So, all right, what is it about Disney Imagineering that's special? Why is it a place that 
obviously everybody talks about, you know, the magic of Disney and so on, but what is it about Disney Imagineering specifically that you found to be special? Well, I have to start with the pixie dust because I feel like I'm pixie dusted forever, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and at walking around the halls at WED, there's magic around every corner. I mean, you walk down and there's a place called the gra graffiti hall where, just, where the artists can go in and draw on the walls it, and, or you might go around the corner in the model shop and there's this enormous model for an entire attraction all built out and you're supposed to go light it, you know, mm -hmm. and or walk around another one, and there's an audio animatronics figure that's that's uh, moving and talking and dancing. <laughs> so, and, and next door is a huge building that I was one of my favorite places to wander into called Mapo, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. which is short for Mary Poppins. And what's Correct. tell tell the listeners what's in Mapo? Uh, Mapo is where they uh, build those audio animatronics, and a lot of the special effects and in lighting things like um, PLC cards and flicker units for lights and all kinds of things that that uh, make this make the the figures work that and make the and make the magic work. So, yes, <laughs> it it fun. it is a, it is a fascinating place to work. And as um, some yes. of the listeners will know, I did work at wed enterprises on epcot center so i had my wed experience but just for a short time for about a year you were there for much much longer obviously um explain to the listeners what the major differences are between a lighting designer who does one stage show after another and goes around and does here's a show you open the show you move on to the next show and someone who works in a in a theme park lighting design business where you're doing big attraction, what, what's the major differences? Time. Time. The time frame. Yeah, it's, um, I, I was used to the adrenaline of you rehearse a show, you, you, you install the show, you tech it and you run it and the excitement the you know, the, the pressure and the adrenaline of it is addicting. <clears throat> when you get to doing theme parks, you're now talking about buildings that are going to be there for decades right. and shows that are going to be there for decades, attractions and all. And it takes time to develop the story and develop the drawings and to get the permits and do the infrastructure and everything else that goes into it. And you might work on a show five years from the beginning to the end. And so it, 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 I went from a lot of work to a 40 to 50 hour work week which is way different than what I was doing before. Was it, did it feel but, slow to you? Yes, it felt very slow in the beginning, yeah. And, and, you, and you work on multiple projects. So you might work on something that's, that's gonna happen open five years later. And you might also be assigned to go right, run to Florida and do a rehab, working with the maintenance division on doing some enhancements. What does and, a rehab mean? Explain. Oh. Uh, um, Every attraction um, almost every year goes down for a couple of days or a couple of weeks to get like a cleaning or um, repairing things, maybe uh, touching up the lighting a little bit, uh, fixing the costumes, uh, repainting things, things like that. They get they that just get worn over time. Sure. Yeah. So, so, so I, when I was working for WED, one of the great experiences I had was to go to Disneyland where you worked for a long time, but I was only there one day and there was no water in Pirates of the Caribbean because they were rehabbing it. And we got to walk down the middle of Pirates of the Caribbean. That was a thrill. That, that was in, um, in 1981 or two, I can't remember now exactly when, uh, and, and they don't take the water out every rehab. It, it's, um, not necessarily. Well, we had a major one where we're working with uh, Tony Baxter and Kim Irvine and, and some of the other designers in Pirates, where we well changed out a lot of the fire effects and we added, uh, we refocused some lights and added some little spots, fixed some, you know, didn't have, have to fix the, the color in the fixtures because we were using dichroic filters that had been in there since 1960. 67 or so. So when dichroic filters, for open. those who don't know, are glass filters. They're not gel. Right. 
with with the color coding on them yeah and it was still the original pirates green that's in there and what um, people don't understand about especially the fire effects in that that particular ride it's it, there's no there's no fire at all it's all no. light yep it's all light and and fabric yeah, I'd say smoke and mirrors, but that's not right. It's all, it's all light. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's light and, and blowing what mylar and fabric and different things to make Something it look like, like flames. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so, okay. So what did you learn at Disney over your years um, about their creative philosophies that you, that, that became part of your creative philosophies? Well, I think the big one is that there is the story to tell but it's not the only story. It's the guest story that we're there for, to help the guests enjoy the park, enjoy the people they're with, their families, to, because they're creating their own stories and their memories. And so it's all about the guest experience and, and giving something to them and their safety, their enjoyment uh, and their memories. And so how did that then... When you would take on a project, I assume you would be assigned to a project. You wouldn't just volunteer to do something, but they would assign you something. Yes, yeah, uh, both. Sometimes I you you can ask for a particular project. Uh, I see. So you'd wind up on a project because it fascinated you and you wanted to be on it. You you could you could ask for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um. So so when you were on a project, you were looking at it from not just the design perspective, but from how the audience would would uh, it would impact the audience. Absolutely. It, it, yeah, it's all about the story and it's about the guest experience. And, and my, I'm, I'm assuming that when you say the audience, it's very different in most cases from going to a theater and watching a live show in a theme park attraction in a ride, for instance, that that is no longer valid to say you're sitting in an audience, you're actually moving or you're walking through or something like that. True. So it's the, a whole audience. Yeah, it's it's a it's a thing in motion, you know. Um, I mean, and everything counts. Uh, every bit of lighting, every sound, everything they can see, everything they can smell, everything they can hopefully not touch too much. But the vehicle they're in, because the vehicles are themed, like everything is themed, and everything has a story. Every every shop, every restaurant. Everything has a backstory to it. And if it's in New Orleans, it's a backstory that fits the New, New Orleans uh, theme. And if it's Frontierland, it's, it's themed to that. So you wouldn't have like a Main Street bakery in Frontierland. Or, you know, it, it all has to be cohesive and, and all work together. It has to be symbiotic throughout. And, yeah. and each, each individual area is its own little sort of thing and it becomes a like you say you're they're telling a story there yes which yeah. is unique to disney because uh, there are very few other theme parks in the world that are like that i think universal studios a little bit but not like disney um yeah it's not like disney <laughs> but you know i'd like universal too i go there sure and, um, and i worked and at universal enjoy. too so yes i you and i both <laughs> have those experiences uh, and yet it is different at universal it's a little I would call it a little rougher around the edges and Disney's a little more refined. That's how I think of it. Oh, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, that's just how I saw it. You, you can actually see where the gates are at Universal Studios where people enter and exit the park. And at Disney, they're, they're well hidden and you really don't know where they are. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you'd, you'd, ha you'd have to know to know rather than the, the guests going, oh, well, there's a way out of the park if you want to go that way. So I think it's, it's a, a little bit different that way. All right. So let's go through your process. You've gotten an assignment, whether you've asked for it or whether somebody's assigned it to you. What's the very first thing that typically would happen? Would it be meetings? Would it be somebody to hand you a book and say, we're going to do this? How, how, what's the typical or is there well, a typical? Um, yeah, there is. Um, pretty much it starts with the story. And so a storyboard and um, the 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 writers and the, the, the concept designers have already been together and talked about it and worked out something. And, and it's, it's not just picking something out that we think is fun to do, that Imagineering thinks it's fun to do. It's something that the parks have asked for. For example, they need an attraction that has X number of people per hour 
that capacity that does this for this particular land. So there's a there's criteria that we need to meet. And so that's the first thing. And then the, the storyboards, uh, we generally have a meeting so you get to see the, the, the different scenes sketched out. Um, so we could, they can talk through, this is how it goes. And there's a, if it's a ride, there's a floor plan. Then they'll say, well, we want the track to do this and go that, that way. And, and so by the time you get involved in a project as a lighting designer, there's a whole lot of work that's already happened. You're, yes. They're not bringing you in at the very earliest concept stages. They're bringing you in after they've made some development progress. Well, we lobby for that um, to get in there really early during the blue sky because uh, lighting and particular lighting can contribute a lot to whatever they're trying to do. But so can audio and so can special effects. And it, it we we tried to get into blue sky meetings and and we sometimes are. Yeah. And so the people that run each of those projects, they are called, remind me again, that they're called producers. They're not directors, right? Producers. Yeah. Show producers. Show producers. And they really run the show. There is no actual stage director, really. Uh, no. Yeah. Correct. So the person that directs the, the project is really called a producer. Well, there's a uh, the roles changed some over the years. Um, the producer usually is the money person mm -hmm. and uh, deals with management. And then there's um, uh, an overall art director who is is responsible for the look of it and everything else. So it's it's kind of like theater where the producer handles the money and the director handles the show itself. So, so the art director would be someone who's actually a very well-known art director. That would be like a Tony Baxter, who was a ride designer. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. I mean, he's, he's a legend at this point. Yes, <laughs> he is. When you started yeah. working there, when I was working there, he was very well-known and highly regarded, but he was yet to become a legend. Now he's a legend. Yeah. When I first started, I was hired into Disneyland. And that was my first thing that Roly was hiring us to take care of the park. So I really spent 10 years there uh, in the weeds, so to speak, of working with maintenance, working with Tony, who was part of the team, along with Kim Irvine and Tom LaDuke and a bunch of others where we um, uh, got to spend time with some of the other legends like Yale Gracie and Wavell Rogers and Mark Miller. And I mean, you know, th the list goes on where we would we learned from them because they would walk with us around the park and point out this thing and tell that story. And, you know, a lot of Rolly's stories started with, well, there's a funny story about that. And he'd go on <laughs> and tell the story. And I regret to this day, I didn't write them down at the oh. time. I should have. <laughs> well, you know, that's, you don't think anything of it at the time, do you? No, but you he don't... tells his own stories. <laughs> and, and, and you probably, when you first, well, I know for a fact, when you first start working there, you don't quite connect up in your head that these people are are the history of the park and yeah. of Disney as a property, period, the whole Disney empire, and that, that they're the connectivity back to Walt. Yep. Yep. I didn't quite, I, I didn't know where who some of the guys really were, their backs, their backstories, but I I pretty soon got a lot of information from both Kim and, and Tony. <clears throat> and it was a wonderful time. I learned so much from them. And I was so honored to like know Yale Gracie a little bit. He had retired, but he came into the park um, with us. And like we would walk the Haunted Mansion and he'd talk about this thing or that thing. Or, well, let, let's or let's let the audience know who Yale Gracie was. Yale Gracie, he basically made the Haunted Mansion the Haunted Mansion. Yeah, between him and, and you know, a, a bunch of the others. I mean, it, there was... There's no one person who's responsible for something like the pirates. Oh, of it's course. such a collaborative thing. It's a real team, and and like a lot of the legend, le Disney legends worked on that attraction. Sure, and, but and, I but I go back to Yale for a second because he was yeah. Pepper's ghost. He's the one that gave you know all of those yep. in phenomenal lighting effects. Really, what they are. Yes. Yeah. It, definitely. And. You know, I got to learn every every one of them, every little tiny thing, you know, all the way up to the 
the moving candles in the windows up in the top of, of the haunted mansion. Wow. And how, how do they work? You know, and I've been going to the park since 1966. And my I wrote Pirates in 1967 when it first opened wow. at grad, my high school grad night. Huh. Um, or my boyfriend's high school grad night, actually. And um, looking at the Haunted Mansion, which was going to open, you know, a couple years later. And and I always wondered about how did they do the moving candles in the window? And and I got to be up there many years later to actually see how it was done. It was, it, it's a wonderful time in my career to to have been there. Well, you, you get to see... Uh, you literally get to see how the magic works. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and for me, for, some people don't want that spoiled for them. To me, that's not spoiling. That's, and I, I love that. I love to know how that thing works, how they make that work. <laughs> yeah. And, and part of my job was to work with maintenance and all to keep it looking like it's supposed to, to keep it good and, and wonderful as somebody remembers it from, the year before or two years ago. So, all right. So Disney is, um, you know, a very successful company and their theme parks are obviously a world renowned. Um, when you are working on a rehab or a new design, either one, um, are they saying to you, you know, you have extreme budgetary limitations or do they sort of take the lid off a little bit and say, do what you need to do to make this look better? Well, it's all planned out in advance. Uh, when you're doing like an enhancement, like uh, the Pirates one I was talking about, we, we did a complete redo of, of the, um, uh, the, the, the jewelry scene, the, the treasure scene. Right. Um, completely redid that whole thing. And it didn't just happen out of the clear blue. It's like the year before, the year and a half before, we were putting in estimates for how much money we needed to do this and how much, you know, what. And, and we had engineering involved and uh, uh, facility planning people involved and maintenance supervisors involved so that uh, we, we could develop a plan. So it just didn't happen. It's something that we actually planned out. And, and so, that, had, so that was within, therefore, as in any good business, within a budgetary constraint. Yes. Yeah. So it's not just go do whatever you want. There's an actual plan to it. There, there's a plan to it. Yeah. Right. That, I think that's important for people to understand, though, though, certainly Disney, unlike anybody else, is not afraid to spend money to make something work well or look good. You know, they're they're They take pride in making things look great. That's one of that is one of the hallmarks of the whole Disney theme park empire is that things look fantastic all the time. Mm hmm. It does. So that planned work also extended to things like, uh, it, there's a, there used to be a, a space between the New Orleans New Orleans restaurant and the Haunted Mansion right. that was just completely fenced around with grass in the middle, and you know, and our our show quality standards group our d resident design team was kind of taking note of customer comments about there's not enough places to sit. You know, people are sitting on walls and sitting on the ground and trying to find. So we took, we put in a proposal to change that area and to carve out walkway there at places to take that circle and open it up and put a fountain in the middle and benches inside of it so there's a nice pleasant place for the guests to sit hmm. it was approved and we did it and we installed the lights and you know, I mean, we didn't install the lights the contractor did or the maintenance did and the benches and things so we helped provide something for the guests that was really needed so that was part of our job to walk around the park and be around the guests to ride the attractions with the guests as a guest no special favors involved. Wait in line so you get to see the queue line and and really experience it as the guests experience it. So nobody does queuing or you know people getting in line called queuing. Nobody does it better than Disney. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so 
that experience too, because sometimes you're in a line for a very long time, that experience too is part of the story, isn't it? It is. And, you know, the Haunted Mansion starts out nice, but it's a short, you know, there's not much to it. I think that probably the best one was Indiana Jones when that one was designed from the very beginning with that in mind it has the best cue line because it's it's, it's it's themed the whole way the whole way once you enter it and it's a long queue it takes a long time to get there and so yeah. if there's nobody in the park if you happen to be lucky enough to be there when there's there are not a lot of uh, guests in the park you can walk in and walk through it pretty quickly but if you're in line you can be in that line a long time and, and they do it in a clever way. Correct me if I'm wrong. There's an intentional not allowing the guests to see very far so that you don't know how long things take. Is that, am I accurate about that? You are. <laughs> yes. Because in the old days, you'd get into a queue line out in front of a ride and you could see how long the line took and you'd go, I don't want to stand in that line and you'd walk away. But now you go into a queue and everything's hidden to you. You can't see ahead. Mm -hmm. So you don't know how long yeah. it's going to take. Right. And there's interesting things along the way to look at. Mm -hmm. It's covered so you're not in the hot sun or out in the cold. So it's it's you're protected from whatever the weather is doing. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes the whole queue line thing uh, more fun, you and, know. Right. Pleasant, I mean, fun. Lines aren't fun. But yeah. Right. It, and by the way, pirates and, and um, Space Mountain and rides that are that I would call dark rides or, or the Haunted Mansion, which is a dark ride. That's perfect going back to your thought about your lighting, just what you want people to see. And the rest of it is in the dark. That's very specific, isn't it? It is. Yeah, you're directing their attention to only what you want them to see. Mm -hmm. it, it's it, like it, a magic trick. <laughs> well, it is like a magic trick. You're, yeah. you, you want them to look here, not there. Well, also sometimes like in the Haunted Mansion, the the ride vehicle itself is actually turning you away from what they don't want you to see and turning yes. you toward what they want you to see. Right. Yes. Yep. What would you say is the most challenging experience that you had in your years at Disney? What, what challenged you the, the most? Oh gosh. Uh, the most challenge. I think probably it would have to be from a, well, there's, there's two things I would say if I can do that. Sure. One is uh, patience. When I moved up to Glendale from Anaheim, I, I went to work on uh, a project called Tomorrowland 2055. Right. It was canceled. <laughs> it never happened. And I went on then to work on a project called Disney's America, which was supposed to be a new America themed theme park somewhere back in, I don't know, Virginia or Pennsylvania somewhere. Right. And it didn't happen. And then I went to work for quite a while on a park called Disney MGM Studios. Yes. Paris. Oh, Paris. Uh huh. And we worked on that. We called it was DMSE, was its shortening. And the whole team worked together. Uh, the lighting team uh, led by Brian Gale, we went over to Paris, we walked around and saw things and talked about, you know, got, came back, did drawings for, we did drawings for months at a time and years at a time. And, um, uh, and it got canceled. So was that, was that terribly frustrating? It was. And we just took, um, we just took, uh, all the drawings and they said just put them in a drawer and we we just walked away from it so i went there for uh, how many years three or four years without doing anything uh, in in a park it was all just frustrating when you say so, there you mean paris yeah well it, yeah i mean we were working on it but i it wasn't the projects weren't going anywhere you know and, it's and, like so they didn't happen and you were working so, on those in glendale not in paris Correct, in Glendale. So after that disappointment, um, I went on to, to work on uh, other projects. But many years down the road, I did the second gate in Paris, Disney Studios Paris. Uh, 
Right. And I got to lead, be the lead lighting designer on that team. And that was my most challenging, is leading a team. Um, it's something I had worked towards. I wanted to be a, a leader. And um, that was my opportunity to do it. So the park was complete, was way different than the first one we were working on. But I got had the privilege of putting together a lighting team. And um, I had already worked with a bunch of designers working on Disney regional entertainment projects, a Disney store. I designed the lighting for a Disney store at Caesars in Las Vegas, um, the Disney store Fifth Avenue in New York, mm. um, Disney Quest in, in Walt Disney World, downtown Disney, and uh, Disney Quest in Chicago. And I had designers that were going with me from team to team and that the art direction team was going on to Disney Studios Paris so I went with them and I I brought some of the team with me and and like um, Laura Yates and Tracy Eck and I had the opportunity to give some very talented women an opportunity to be the lead designer for an entire land Wow. And for for projects, and it's worked out really well. Laura is still um, at Imagineering, and she's a principal lighting designer now. And Tracy Ack is a principal, or I mean, is the art the art director for Disneyland for for Disney Paris. Wow. Yes. So she went on from lighting. How I'm, I want to go back a half a step to the various um, shops that you've worked on. Because yeah. that's something I've never done. And I am fascinated by it because it is important how things are lit in a shop as to whether people will buy things or not. Yes? Yes. Oh, very much. <laughs> and so what, what is this, the principal difference between lighting, say, a dark ride and lighting a shop, lighting a, a place where people are going to purchase things? Well, um, it's that directing the guests' attention to something in particular that you want them to see. Mm. So it's it's... It's all about that of of light the merchandise, you know, and uh, to make it look as good as possible. Um, and there there are recommended practices for lighting shops, how many foot candles something needs to be, what the ratio needs to be between circulating area and the 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 whatever it is you're highlighting and trying to sell. The merchandise. I, I would assume more light, less dark. Uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> yeah. And and then, of course, there's always the decorative stuff, which was a lot of fun. The chandeliers and the wall sconces and the fun things that are um, uh, that you find in shops. Would, would you say that light influences people to actually make purchases versus ignoring yeah. something? Uh, yes. Yeah. I think yeah, that's it's, very interesting. Yeah, if, uh, yeah, highlighting it, if, um, it in lighting a, a, like a, a casework, right. if you can look vertically on the sides, you side light something which helps bring out its shape and right. its color. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. It changes the way people perceive things and then the way they feel about it. Yeah, it brings out the color, brings out the sparkle. So highlights. even though you worked on a number of projects that that uh, ultimately weren't r realized, um, you still worked on many projects that were realized. And my imagination tells me, even as you worked on them for lengthy periods of time, there were time periods that were full of pressure where you had to get something done. It had to be done X amount of time. They're gonna open the park at a certain time. You need to be done. It needs to be in place. It needs to be focused, et cetera, et cetera. What is, what is your way of dealing with pressure when you're under the gun like that? Oh, wow. That's quite a question. Um, well, trying to be as prepared as possible, as mm -hmm. organized as possible, as uh, forward thinking as possible to have thought through things way in advance, not waiting to the last minute. And, you know, we, as the designers, we don't touch the lights, actually those are contractors that are doing that. So you spend a lot of time working with contractors and, um, uh, you know, going through, going over specs and doing things. So it's, it's being focused and being prepared. 
So I, I imagine, and I'm going to ask you a question, don't name any names. My imagination tells me that over the time that you worked, there were probably a contractor or two, or maybe a Disney employee or two who made life not easy for you, who created issues for whatever, because that's humanity. That's how people are. What is your methodology of dealing with someone who is not necessarily being helpful or cooperative? <laughs> oh, well, the first thing is getting to my own place of, um, <laughs> of, <zen, laughs> of take a deep breath and Zen and being very patient but but being direct and uh, not confrontational, hopefully. <laughs> Try not to be confrontational. <laughs> Try to talk through things. But in terms of my own self, of taking a deep breath and knowing that it's going to be all right, we just need to work it out. So it is, so it is. I'm, I'm, I'll ask a lot of guests that question because I think it's interesting to see how people under pressure respond. Your response is, is to step back and take a breath as opposed to, to forging ahead like crazy yeah because i have a temper so i know that <laughs> i <laughs> i know that about myself so i know that i need to take a deep breath and um uh, not jump in too quickly to think about it so that leads me to my next question which is about collaborating obviously everything that you did at disney was in collaboration with others whether they're other designers or builders or contractors or executives or whoever what is for you the secret of collaborating with people oh um a couple things well the communications that's a, probably the obvious one but <clears throat> there's a a component of that 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 I call the communication of reassurance that um that's really to, good the communication of reassurance yeah yeah so that people get jumpy about deadlines about things getting done and so on so if you're able to uh not just go away and like do your thing but you go away and then you touch bases with them and say here's what do you think of this? Or this is what I'm thinking, or here's where we are with this. So they know that you're working on it, that you haven't just gone off the, you know, down the hall and around the corner, you they'll never see you until there's a crisis. So you want to avoid the crisis and reassure them that you've got a handle on it, that you're handling it. Reassurance. It goes a long ways. And and that and taking that deep breath at those various times. Yeah. Well, because yeah. collaboration is, you know, it's challenging for a lot of artists who like to work in their own space. But you have your own space, but yet you have to work with others in that business. Yeah. Well, the theater training, there's a lot of people in theme parks who are theater trained. And sure. so they understand the collaboration part of it. Um, that, um, that you can't do a show without collaboration. It's that simple. Is there one thing over all this time that if you had an opportunity, you'd go back and redo totally? Oh my, no, I can't think of one, not one. So, so, so you're satisfied with what you've done then? Pretty much. Yeah. I think I that's, I think that's, uh, that's admirable. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure, I'm sure, I'm not sure some, everybody I, can say that, you know. I'm sure there are some, but I don't really think about it. You know, I try, 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 try to, you know, avoid those terrible, crazy things. And I'm sure there's some somewhere. I'm sure, I'm sure there, there must be, but yet you're, you've got the right attitude, I think, which is to not let that become part and parcel of your, even your thinking. So I think yeah. that that's good. Well, I've been speaking to Paula Dinkle, um, a world-class lighting designer for almost an hour now. And I'm just wondering in all your experiences at Disney, can you think of, or it could be outside of Disney for that matter. It doesn't matter in all of your experiences. Do you, are you able to relate to us to give us a story that's either um, strange, weird, quirky, offbeat, or just plain funny? I have one that's probably all of that. <laughs> good. Um, in around 19... 83 or so there was a big rolling power blackout all across southern california um and uh i was in the park that night i was in my office which is an, a trailer that was behind the haunted mansion 
Okay. And uh, we had walkie-talkie radios in those days um, before cell phones. And um, Tom LeDuc was also there. We're working late at night for some something or other. And everything goes down and it's blackout. And it's like, oh my gosh. And we're hearing it on the radio. And the generators came on in some parts of the park, but not every parts of the park. And that happened to be Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> and there's guests in boats in total darkness. Oh. So Tom and I, you know, we 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 called into security and ops and, and volunteered to go help. And they said, yes, please. And so we went over there and um, we went in the side door and onto one of those, the ramp to one of those little boats that floats out there in the blue bayou. Right. Right. So we're in the upper level and there, there's guests in boats going, hello, hello. And we're, we've got flashlights and all. We're going, hello, you okay? Yeah, we're fine. It's like, okay. So Tom got in the water. and You um, mean in the water itself? He actually got in the water? Yeah. Okay. He can walk in the water. Right. In, in, in waders, right. And so he walked, I stayed there on the uh, on the, on the dock there at the little house. And um, he went and got a boat and pushed it over to the dock. And I helped the guests out, and handed them over to operations people. And, and wow. you know, you would think that people would be freaking out, but they weren't. The guests were not. We could hear guests singing, yo, ho, yo, ho. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, yeah, and it's... Uh, they apparently they thought it was a real adventure and so did we it was kind of like really strange so we got that you know help them and and uh, as best we could and then we went down to main street well main street was completely dark uh, uh and so operations and everyone were, were trying to help people leave the park the only thing that was only light on main street were the gas lamps and we had just got them turned on again in 19, it must have been 82, got the lights turned on again in 82. The gas lamps had been turned off and at around 72 or so during the gas crisis, if, if you remember that. And they never got turned on again until we started looking at it saying, we really should get those gas lamps working. Can Are, are the pipes still good? And we put in a request to do it for planned work. It was approved and they had just gotten them working again um, shortly before the power outage. So you had a little bit of light. Yes, we had a little bit of light. And, yeah. and it was kind of romantic light and on top of that. It was. <laughs> and operations was very grateful to have that light there. Yeah. I bet they were. Because <laughs> yeah. that had to have been a, an operational nightmare. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Try but, you know. The guests were so well behaved. It was really amazing to see that they but, they weren't panicking. They felt safe enough, you know, and they just knew that you know they needed to exit the park slowly and carefully. That's amazing, actually. Yeah, yeah, and, it was. And nobody was mad that they were losing their their night at the park. I I didn't see anybody that that seemed to be angry or anything. They That's... they just sort of. Uh, Wow. And that's phenomenal. Uh, I, I think that's a hilarious story and also kind of a little bit scary, to be honest with you. Yeah, it was. It was uh, surely got the adrenaline going. <laughs> yeah, because because crowds of people can do funny things and especially under weird circumstances like that. Yeah, but they were well behaved, really. That, that's that's great. All right. Well, last question for you tonight, uh, Paula. Um do you have a, a solid piece of advice or a tip for someone who's maybe entering into either lighting design or theme park lighting design or something else, um, and or, or someone maybe that's in a little bit and is trying to reach that next level? I do. Um, I people who are coming out of theater have a have a have a better chance than say an electrical engineer or illumination engineer, but for somebody coming out of theater and going to theme parks. They have to learn more about our, about architectural lighting, about the fixtures, and about the power, and about controls and things that you did a different kind of thing than you learned in in drama school. 
Um, so I would say if you're coming out of with a theater degree and you want to do theme parks, go take classes with the IES. Join the Themed Entertainment Association, Next Gen. They have a whole group of up and coming. Uh, and get involved in the Themed Entertainment Association. And you kind of got to be there. You know, where it's what I say to the, the kids. I do a lot of mentoring with ETC, mm-hmm. um, with the students and the ones who are like coming out of a small town in Wisconsin and they want to work Broadway. Well, you can't work Broadway if you're in a small town in Wisconsin. You know, you kind of got to be headed towards Broadway or doing regional entertainment, a regional uh, theaters. So, uh, so, it, so you get the pathway to it. Once you become an established designer, you can live anywhere you want because you can fly in and and so on. But um, so the theme parks, if you want to work theme parks, Los Angeles, Florida, maybe, you know, uh, uh, there's other theme parks around if you want to work tech. But if you want to design, it's Los Angeles or Orlando. Mm. Well, I think that's very valuable because people come out and they don't know what to do. And that's a good piece of advice for anyone who's trying to figure out how to make it in the business. Yeah, there's a good book called um, The Proximity Principle. Is that if you want to do, if you whatever it is you want to do, you have to be nearby to it. Um, so um, how, it's a how good true book. is that? That's really true. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's partly who you know, but but what you know also, you know, who you know might get you the interview. What you know will get you the job. And um, maybe there's a lot of competition. I was told that when I uh, interviewed for my job, that there were hundreds of applications. <laughs> it was like, whoa, <clears throat> yeah. So, and it's probably true. So I, tr- I tell people uh, who want to become an Imagineer, it's like, that's nice. Your chances are, are it's tough. There's a lot of competition, but um, uh, try to become the best designer you can be so that you're ready if you get the opportunity to become an Imagineer. That is phenomenal advice. I think that's really sound stuff and, and, and useful for someone that would like to have a life working in design at arguably the greatest theme park company that's ever been and may ever be. Um, so <laughs> Paula Dinkle, this has been a fantastic hour on Storybeat, and I'm so glad that, uh, we got a chance to catch up a little bit and that, that, uh, uh, you spent some time here talking about your experiences in lighting for uh, Walt Disney Imagineering. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been great fun. And so we've come to the end of today's Story Beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden, and may all your stories be unforgettable.